right. Is it time? Yes. It's time. Right. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Father. I hope I'm able to project enough for you in the latter part of the room back there to hear. Yeah. Uh, but let me know if I need to be louder, okay? Uh, but welcome. Glad you all can join us for uh, this new series that we're starting today. Uh, let's begin with prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and then kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant us in that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Gerard and Joe. Pray for us. St. Jerome. Pray for us. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so if you've uh, taken part in these series over the last few years, you know that we worked our way gradually through the Catechism. There are four parts to the Catechism. So we spent four years in the fall of each year working our way through the Catechism. And as we were, the adult faith formation team was discerning what to do next, uh, I proposed the idea of looking at the Second Vatican Council. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, the intention is to spend the next four falls <laughs> looking at the four major documents of the Second Vatican Council. So when you came in, hopefully you got a copy of the schedule for these sessions, just this one page here, along with a copy of the text of the first document that we're going to look at. This may look a little intimidating and imposing. <laughs> Don't be afraid. This is not even required reading necessarily, uh, but it's for you to, to take and, and read along if you would like to read before we, you come to each class. Um, so today, September 30th, we're just going to spend the time today giving kind of a, a historical context for Vatican II itself. We're going to talk a little bit about what is an ecumenical council, how many have there been, what was it that led to uh, the Second Vatican Council at the time when it happened? And then from there, we'll move in in the coming weeks through the actual document that we're going to look at. Uh, so you've got um, each of the weeks and the parts of the document that we'll be talking about if you want to read along before you come or to review after you come. You can do that. I would point out that on uh, the third session, we made a little tweak uh, actually because of my own personal calendar. So the morning session for the third meeting will happen on October 21st. We will not meet in the morning on October the 14th. It will be the opposite for the evening. So if, if you were going to come in the evening, it, we would, the evening would meet on October the 14th, but not on the 21st, because on the 21st we have evening prayer in our monthly speaker in church. So just take note of that. Um, the morning and the evening will be covering the same materials, so you can, if you have to miss the morning, you want to come in the evening, or vice versa, you can do that, and you'll be covering the same materials. Is there a question? So that's, you're covering chapter 2 and 3 on the fourth, on the Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, chapters 2 and 3 will be covered in that one session, the 14th and before the 21st. Okay. So... The first question probably for us to ask is, what is an ecumenical council? The Second Vatican Council was an ecumenical council of the Catholic Church. And an ecumenical council is when the Pope, for one reason or another, finds it important to gather together all of the bishops of the world to come together and to meet and to discuss some particular topic in the life of the Church. So the word ecumenical here, we often associate that with kind of relations between Christian churches and communities. Uh, because the word ecumenical means essentially kind of um, the, 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 the entire body, if you will, a gathering together of the entire body. But in this case, the term ecumenical refers to the Catholic bishops of the world, a gathering together of all of the Catholic bishops, both from the East and the West in the Catholic Church. So... We are uh, Latin Rite Catholics, but there are uh, several, a number of other branches of the Catholic Church, Eastern Rite Churches, that have their own patriarchs and bishops as well, who are in full communion with the Catholic Church. 
and an ecumenical council gathers them all together. Now, Vatican II actually did invite uh, non-Catholic representatives to the council. They didn't have the same voting authority as the Catholic bishops did in the council, but they were invited to attend and to, uh, to listen in on, on the sessions of Vatican II. So that, I believe, was something new uh, that happened for the first time at Vatican II. So this is actually the 21st ecumenical council in the history of the church. So over the 2,000 years of the church's history, uh, we've had 21 ecumenical councils. So you can tell uh, these are uh, kind of extraordinary moments in the life of the church. They don't happen all that commonly. And they're not even on like a set schedule. Like every so many years you have an ecumenical council. It's really the discernment of the pope and others in the leadership of the church who recognize a need to call together the bishops for a council. Uh, the vast majority of councils before Vatican II were called because of some particular uh, doctrinal crisis or issue that needed to be discussed and decided upon by the bishops. So the early councils, the first councils of the church, Nicaea, Ephesus, Chalcedon, names you may have heard, they took up a lot of the issues of like fundamental questions about Jesus. Who is Jesus Christ? Is he a human person? Is he a divine person? So those councils established for us our understanding of the two natures and the one person of Jesus Christ. Uh, Ephesus famously attributed to Mary the title Mother of God because of the divinity of her son, Jesus Christ. Uh, the early councils also discussed the use of images, icons, statues, and these sorts of things, whether um, that was indeed appropriate for us to use such things in our, in our worship and in our prayer. Um, the council, two councils before Vatican II would have been the Council of Trent, which happened in the 1500s. It was called in response to the Protestant Reformation. So the bishops of the world, seeing this crisis in the life of the church, discerning how the Catholic Church needed to respond and move forward. Uh, Vatican I happened in the, it was the late 1800s, and uh, the main topic there was papal infallibility. That council was actually interrupted uh, because of unrest and, and war. Uh, so Vatican II was called in the early, it met in the early 1960s, 1962 to 1965. Uh, one of the lines that St. John Paul II used of the Second Vatican Council is he said it, it, it is the, and this is so, you know, 15, 20 years probably after the council, he called Vatican II the compass with which the church will take her bearings in the 21st century. So Vatican II is not outdated. The St. John Paul II, Pope Benedict followed this, certainly Pope Francis is a man of the Second Vatican Council. They all see this as really kind of setting the path for the church in our times. There's a lot of confusion about what Vatican II did and didn't say, and I think that will be uh, enlightening to you as we look at the actual texts of the documents of the Second Vatican Council uh, to see what is actually in the text and what is not necessarily in the text, but sometimes is attributed to the Second Vatican Council. So uh, I'll have a few more comments about Vatican II and kind of leading us into this document that we're going to look at. But right now we're going to take about 20 minutes and watch a little documentary that's available on YouTube that kind of sets for us the particular historical context and circumstances for Vatican II. So sit back, relax. <laughs> Hopefully this will work. And. Uh, here we go. Vatican II. Perhaps no other gathering has sparked more excitement, ignited more controversy, or caused more change within the Roman Catholic Church. An assembly of over 2,500 bishops from around the world, the Council has been declared by many the pivotal event of the Church's contemporary history. Some say that Vatican II came out of the blue, while others argue that the Council was long overdue. But what led the Church to convene this ecumenical summit in the first place? What scientific ideas, social climate, and political atmosphere factored into the decisions that emerged from the Council? 
Join us as we meet with historians and theologians, eyewitnesses and experts to investigate the meaning of Vatican II and uncover the event which would become a definitive landmark in the history of the modern Catholic Church. The very first Kmart department store is launched in the United States. A new rock and roll blues band called the Rolling Stones debuts in the UK, and Hollywood mourns the death of starlet Marilyn Monroe. Comic books featuring a green superhero, The Incredible Hulk, hit the press. Just one month after JFK's promise to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, Pope John XXIII, leader of the Catholic Church, does something altogether unexpected. He announces the 21st Ecumenical Council in Rome, Italy. An event which would become known worldwide as Vatican II. Many historians uh, say that Vatican II was probably the most significant religious event in the 20th century. It was a very, very uh, important, not simply for the Catholic Church, but you might say for the entire world. But not everyone initially saw the potential of such a council. On January 25th, 1959, a group of cardinals gathered together in the Basilica of St. Paul's outside the walls for the day of prayer for Christian unity. It was here, at the very end of the service, that Pope John made his announcement, first revealing his intention to hold a new ecumenical council in the coming years. Pope John again announces the council at a meeting of some of his closest advisors at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls of Rome. And when he does, he actually announces three things he hopes to accomplish during his pontificate. The first is he wants to hold a diocesan synod for the Diocese of Rome. Second, he announces his intention to um, revise the Code of Canon Law, which had last been promulgated in 1917. And then third, almost as an afterthought, is going to convene a new ecumenical council. Obviously, it was the third point that caught everybody's attention. But the cardinals present did not applaud or cheer. They simply remained in absolute silence. I think there were a lot of people who thought the time of ecumenical councils had passed, and they were necessary in a previous period of the church, but they really were no longer necessary today. So when Pope John announced that he intended to convene a council, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. But what prompted this sudden call to action by the Pope? On the surface, it seemed as though the Catholic Church of the late 50s had been booming, with mass attendance in the U.S. at an all-time high and parish life expanding. Enrollment in seminaries was up, and more Catholic schools were being built and opened with each new year. Vatican II came out of a whole series of events, both in the world and in the church. Nothing, nothing in the church ever happened in the Vatican. There's always a history to it. It was the Second World War, and then you also had the First World War. So I think that many Catholics, especially in Western Europe, were saying, well, we really need to address this violence and this uh, lack of peaceful coexistence. But of course, after the war then, came the Cold War. And now, and the, and the Iron Curtain. So now you had a whole section of Europe cut off from the rest. And uh, with that, you also had a militant atheism, a, uh, an official atheism, and practiced in the, in the Soviet Union. Now, atheism has been around for a while. In the 19th century, you had, uh, uh, let's say, a philosophical atheism. But now you had a political atheism, a government sponsored atheism. And how is the church going to address that? Pope John XXIII was a much loved pope, uh, elected in 1958. He was only on the chair of Peter for five years, and yet he left an enormous impression on the world. Um, even for those outside the Catholic Church, he was 
greatly respected, revered for his compassion, his almost avuncular style of leadership. Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli was born in 1881 in the mountain region of Lombardy, Italy, the fourth and eldest son of 13 children. Growing up in a farming family, Angelo spent his youth in the agricultural town of Sotto il Monte, a small village nearly swallowed by the shadow of the surrounding Dolomiti Mountains. A jovial parish priest with a witty sense of humor, even in regard to himself, he emanated a very personal and pastoral style that went beyond the usual protocol of papal audiences. He had been a, a scholar, a historian by training, a church diplomat during a very difficult time, World War II, where he was the papal ambassador in Bulgaria and Greece. It was during this time that Roncalli would experience firsthand a profound moment of friendship with the people he was serving outside of his own country. During the war, he aided Jewish Turks and Greeks by issuing forged baptismal certificates in order to keep their true identities hidden from Nazi officials. In 1945, the war would eventually come to an end. After years of fighting and many lives lost, Nations were left torn apart, and life had become something altogether changed. After the war, the great empires were dismantled, and you had the rise of new independent states. Colonialism was over. Uh, so now you had uh, local churches in different countries, in Africa especially, but also in Asia, who were um, now having to deal uh, with uh, their own local governments, some of which were friendly to the church, some were not. Uh, so how, how do you deal with that phenomenon of, of newly independent nations? It was not only what was going on in the world that led Pope John to call for a council, but also what was going on in the church. There is evidence that his predecessor, Pope Pius XII, had thought about convoking a council. Even in his teaching, Pius XII was laying the groundwork for change in the church. He encouraged the study of scripture with modern methods. He initiated reforms in the celebration of Holy Week, he even wrote an encyclical on the church as the mystical body of Christ, and in this way brought the church back to a more biblical understanding of her very nature. Pope Pius XII was, was uh, really uh, brought about some breakthroughs. Uh, he wrote an encyclical on liturgy, maybe after day. He brought about some uh, reforms of the liturgy, and in that sense then he gave, he gave also an encouragement to the liturgical movement that was going on in the church. The council would officially begin on October 11th, 1962. But how do we arrive from Pope John's announcement on January 25th, 1959, to the opening of Vatican II? The Holy Father wanted to know what the bishops held as the most important topics to be addressed. The church in every country had a voice as the pastoral leaders were being asked to share their concerns for the future of evangelization. We had to get about the business of planning for the council. I mean, this is a major undertaking. Uh, and so the first thing that is done is the creation of not a preparatory commission, but an anti-preparatory commission, a pre-preparatory commission. And this commission is charged with figuring out what the heck the council is going to do. He appoints Cardinal Cardini as the president of the anti-preparatory commission. And their charge, the charge of that commission, and it's made up mostly of senior officials from the Roman Curia, those who work in the Vatican full time, their task is to figure out what the agenda for the council will be. So they send out a query to all the bishops throughout the world. Immediately, the task of the commissions proved daunting due to the overwhelming volume of responses from the bishops. Now, the drama of the preparation is largely a result of the fact that the Pope made a decision very early on when those ten preparatory commissions were created to appoint as the head of each of those preparatory commissions a prefect from one of the Roman congregations. Now this was very controversial because while the heads of the Roman congregations, the members of the Curia, 
were for the most part very godly men, very holy men who loved the church a great deal. They were also full-time bureaucrats. In preparation for the council, they condensed the responses into 2,000 pages of material in 70 schemata, or draft documents, double the amount of text from all of the previous councils combined. These initial drafts would be distributed to the bishops over the course of the years leading up to and including the council. But all of those factors together, who was controlling the preparation, what theologians were invited to participate, the rules that seemed to put people who knew Latin really well in advantage over those who didn't, the kind of mediocre quality of the theology in a lot of those drafts, the fact that there are 70 documents, but there was no real plan for what documents would be addressed in what order. When you put all of that together, as we became, as the council became closer to beginning, right, as we get to the fall of 1962, many leading churchmen, many of the leading bishops, particularly in North America and Western Europe, were getting increasingly concerned that this council was going to fail. But the Holy Spirit prevailed. From those drafts, two would actually go on to receive approval in the first session. Documents on liturgy and the media. Arriving in Rome, the bishops from all corners of the world came for a profoundly sacred event, but also had to concern themselves with the necessity of lodging. Some stayed at houses run by religious orders. Others at seminaries, such as the North American College, and others at hotels. They may not have anticipated it then, but these places would turn out to be their homes for the next four years. Today, an updated Hotel Michelangelo stands where it was originally built in the 60s, a hotel constructed specifically to help house participants of the council. At the beginning, it was thought that the council would only last for the autumn of 1962. But the very dynamics of the debates and guidance of the Spirit would lead them to meet in the fall of the following three years as well. Little did they know that those years would also see such momentous events as the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963, and the address of Pope Paul VI to the United Nations in New York in 1964. But now, to the opening of the council itself. It was a beautiful evening, slightly chilly, typical fall evening, splendid full moon, and the dome of the basilica was illumined by giant uh, spotlights provided by the Italian army. And tens of thousands of Romans came to St. Peter's Square spontaneously, and there was so much enthusiasm that finally, Pope John the 23rd himself came to the window and he spoke very briefly to the Roman people and uh, at the end then he said it's getting late, we're all tired, why don't you all go home now and when you get home give your children a kiss and tell them that it's a kiss from the Pope and the next day the uh, headlines in the, in the Roman newspapers they signaled not only the opening of the council but also as they said, un bacio dal Papa, a kiss from the Pope. The Council brought together bishops from all over the world, who now had a profound experience of the universality of the Church. Even those living in Rome at the time shared in this exciting experience. I was responsible for a group of seminarians to show them around Rome, and I thought this would be a great day to come to the church of St. Andrew on the Carindal Hill. And we walked up here, it was about a 40 minute walk from the North American College, and just as we got here to the Carindal Palace first, uh, there was a changing of the guard. A very typical oompa oompa type of uh, ceremony, very colorful, and uh, again, uh, here in front of the presidential palace, what used to be though, the papal palace. After that, then, we walked up just a hundred yards or so to the Church of St. Andrew, a very small church, but there was a crowd around it, and uh, nobody could get into the church. Standing on the front steps of the, of the church was Cardinal Wyszynski. He was the primate of Poland, and obviously he was waiting for somebody to arrive. 
just at that point, a car pulls up a limousine with license plates SCV1, Vatican City State 1, obviously. That was the uh, car of the Pope, Pope John XXIII. Came bouncing out of the car and up the steps of the church to be greeted by Cardinal Wyszynski. And the two of them then went into the church to pray. Of course, the bishops could not do anything without the assistance of a number of theologians who served as experts or periti on particular issues and in the drafting of the final documents that would be approved. Among the bishops was the young and impressive Archbishop of Krakow, Karol Wojtyła, who would later become Blessed John Paul II. And among the experts, a young priest theologian by the name of Joseph Ratzinger, more commonly known today as Pope Benedict XVI. He's very much a Pope today, Benedict XVI, who was shaped by the Council. And uh, I think he sees himself in line with Blessed John Paul II as trying to continue uh, the renewal that Vatican II inspired. He's also a Pope of dialogue, and he has continued uh, a number of the traditions put in place by his predecessor. From the very beginning, it was the hope of Pope John XXIII that the Council would foster the unity of all the Christian churches. For this reason, he invited representatives of the Orthodox and Protestant churches to be present as observers of the Council. But they would also have the opportunity to participate in many informal discussions outside of the Council floor. It was the genius of John XXIII to recognize that the only way all this ferment can be channeled in a positive and creative way was to call the council. Ours is not a hermeneutic of discontinuity, a fancy way of saying, um, we're not just about novelty, we're about fidelity. And he proposed himself, in place of that, a hermeneutic of reform that um, is ready to make changes provided that they are faithful to the patrimony of the church. And the Pope really got at this when he said that hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture. Uh, we've got to avoid that. We don't, and, and, and I think ordinary Catholics would get caught up in pre Vatican II and post Vatican II language as if they're different churches. And we, we recognize, no, this is a, a 2,000 year tradition. There was novelty, but that novelty, uh, and there was sometimes also reversal, but they were reversal in terms of particular streams of thought, never a repudiation of the great tradition of the church. But a, a, another way of thinking about this is to recognize the character. This is what, what you were talking about. The Pope recognized that, of course, the Council was about reform. The question is, what constitutes, and here I'm going to borrow from one of the uh, title of a book by one of the most influential theologians of the Council, Ian Congar, who wrote a book, True and False Reform. He says the key question is, what's authentic reform and what's inauthentic reform? In the Decree of Cuminus, it says, authentic renewal will always be an increase in fidelity to the church's own calling. So how do we reform ourselves? We go back and ask, what are we really about? How are we more faithful to the body of Christ, the people of God? It reminds me of a great statement by Carl Hume, the late Carl Hume. And he said, there are some people who think of the church as a fortress, and, and therefore unchanging, unchangeable. And there are other people who think of the church as, as a pilgrim people. And so he concludes, he says, you know, sometimes it's better to live in Abraham's tent with its uncertainty and in Solomon's temple with its certainties. That is, that's it, you know, inevitably the, the church is on as a pilgrim people. And so, you know, that there's always going to be some controversy, some conflict. In fact, people sometimes harken back to what they consider the golden age of the church. From a historical point of view, I don't think there ever was a golden age. You know, that C.S. Lewis famous. famously said when people appeal to tradition, there's always a danger that what they're really appealing to is the period just before the Rome. Mm -hmm. And as Catholics, we don't have that luxury. We appeal to the great tradition, the 2,000 year tradition, and take all of that into account. This, uh, you know, is reminiscent of that one of those important uh, buzzwords that we associate uh, with Vatican II, especially those of us who teach 
Vatican II and, and have poured over the text, uh, the word is resource long, going back to the sources, returning to the sources. Um, it's often paired with another uh, term, an Italian word, aggiornamento, to update the church. Well, I think that the, um, the last 50 years since the council uh, have taught us that there's no aggiornamento without going back to the sources, to the scriptures, to the fathers of the church, the great doctors of the church. Um, reform is always about, as Ethel Gar said, greater and greater fidelity. Diligentia began with that magnificent uh, description of the church coming out of the Trinity. But then, in the second to the last chapter, it talks about us being a pilgrim church, and that we're constantly on the road, but we're never quite there. And therefore, uh, we continue, and maybe someday there will be a Vatican III, but right now we deal with Vatican II and its challenge to, to keep us uh, constantly renewing ourselves in that spirit. Today, Roman Catholics celebrate Mass in the vernacular, or common language of their respective countries. But how did it come about? And where was Jesus Christ in the middle of all of this? What did the bishops at Vatican II do in terms of the life of the Church? Tune in next time to Vatican II, Inside the Council. won't be tuning in next time. So hopefully I gave you a, a nice kind of historical uh, context for the Second Vatican Council and a little bit of a way to approach it. Um, what we're going to do is look at the actual uh, written documents of Vatican II to see um, what it was that these 2,500 bishops from the world gathered together, um, discussed and approved and promulgated to the world as the fruit of their time together at the Second Vatican Council. Um, I did want to share with you today a couple little passages from uh, now St. John the 23rd. He was canonized along with John Paul II. Uh, they were canonized together by Pope Francis a few years back. Um, he gave an address to all of the bishops gathered on the very first day of the council. So it was October the 11th, 1962 in which he gave, in his own words, what his hopes and desires and intentions were for the council. And this was after, as we learned, these three years of preparation from when he announced the council in 1959 to the actual opening of the council in 1962. Um, and he, he started his words uh, early on in this address by saying this, the major interest of the ecumenical council is this, that the sacred heritage of Christian truth be safeguarded and expounded with greater efficacy. So I think that's really important for us to approach Vatican II in this way. A lot of times we can think that they were kind of touching on this at the end, as kind of Vatican II as this great um, divide of the church. And we can talk in those terms of pre-Vatican II and post-Vatican II, as he said, as if there's almost two different churches. When in fact, the goal of Pope John the 23rd was precisely to safeguard the truth that had always been taught by the church consistently for 2,000 years and to share it with the world with greater efficacy. And I think what you're going to see is ultimately this becomes called today the new evangelization. This is what the popes in recent years have meant with the new evangelization. The same saving truth that Jesus gave us that the church has always taught, how do we bring it to bear for the people of today? That was the goal of the uh, Second Vatican Council. So John the 23rd went on to say, our duty is not just to guard this treasure as though it were some museum piece and we the curators. What is needed is a new enthusiasm, a new joy and serenity of mind in the unreserved acceptance by all of the entire Christian faith. And I think you'll see as we work our way through the documents really how, how beautiful they are and uh, how profound they are at this communicating to the world these treasures of, of our Christian faith. So actually, the, uh, if you flip through the Catechism of the Catholic Church and just glance at the footnotes, one of the things you'll notice is probably Scripture is the most commonly cited source 
in the Catechism, which is a good thing. The revealed Word of God, the, the written Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the second most common citation you will see throughout the Catechism are the documents of the Second Vatican Council. So it's, it really is foundational for how we understand and share the faith in our day. Um, the Council happened at a time in which not only in the church but in the world there was a lot of kind of tumult and, and uncertainty and, and changing of culture and these sorts of things. And I think sadly um, a lot of what the council intended to do got kind of swept up in that. And, and so there was kind of a period of dissent in the church, which really is the opposite of what John the Twenty Third wanted after the council, right? He wanted, as he said, uh, the unreserved acceptance by all of the entire Christian faith. And so we'll see as we look at these documents, um, this call to, to faith in, in the, the truths of, of the Christian faith. So the council ultimately ended up with 16 different documents that were issued to the world. Four of them, there are kind of four major documents that are called constitutions from the Second Vatican Council. And so what we're going to do this year is look at the first of those constitutions, and hopefully in the coming years, look at the other three of those constitutions as well. So the first one is the one that was um, distributed today. <laughs> The title in Latin is Sacrosanctum Concilium. The church's tradition is to title these documents with the very first words of the document. Uh, and typically the official language of the document is in Latin. So this is Latin for the Sacred Council. That's all Sacrosanctum Concilium means, the Sacred Council. Um, but the English title above that is Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Because this whole document... Uh, teaches about and uh, proposes certain reforms in the church's liturgy. So liturgy refers to, first of all, the Mass, uh, our, our public worship together in the Mass, but also the other sacraments of the church. So we're going to see in here um, some discussion of the other sacraments. The liturgy is the church's whole kind of official public worship. The liturgy of the hours is also part of the, the church's liturgy. So all of this is going to be touched upon in this document. Um, so this was the first document that was approved by the council. As you can see, it was officially promulgated um, by Pope Paul VI, who became pope in the middle of the council, on December 4, 1963. So if you remember, the bishops met pretty much in the fall of 1962. They came back in the fall of 63, 64, and 65. And this was... Um, the first of the documents to be approved by them for the very uh, simple and practical reason that the document was almost in its final form in the preparatory document that was prepared for the bishops. So there was certainly discussion and, and revision of that initial kind of preparatory document, but it was pretty much ready to go. The bishops just had to come together and finalize and, and they would take a vote and approve. And it's actually interesting, um, you know, you might think that, especially in our current political climate, that it was kind of a, a fiery and very divided thing. But in fact, if you look at the votes of the bishops during Vatican II, uh, it's, for the most part, it's like there's 2,500 bishops. There might be some bishops who don't vote to approve, but it's like 24, 50 to 50 or something like that. So. There's a very broad consensus and buy-in from all the bishops uh, into these documents of Vatican II. Um, and in fact, what ultimately came to be in this document was in many ways kind of in the works in the life of the church already in the decades leading up to the Second Vatican Council. So they mentioned Pope Pius XII had issued an encyclical on the liturgy during his time as Pope. Um, and it was all kind of, underneath it all, was what has come to be known as the liturgical movement, which was this, this common desire for a, a renewal of the liturgy, and especially, and you'll see this throughout Sacrosanctum Concilium, especially the desire for a more uh, complete and fruitful participation of all of the people in the liturgy. So even before uh, the reforms after Vatican II, 
Um, it had been common, for example, for the server to provide the responses to the priest in kind of the dialogue portions of the Mass. And the liturgical movement proposed that the whole people gathered would take part in those responses, something very common and ordinary to us now, but then it wasn't. So that's one example of the kind of things that was kind of moving already in the liturgical movement in the church. Um, at the very beginning, of, we're going to look at the introduction in the first chapter more fully next week. But if you just look at paragraph number one, this is how all the church documents work. They, paragraphs are numbered for easy reference. Paragraph number one, so these are the very first official words of the bishops of the Second Vatican Council. And it lays out uh, the, what they saw as the goals, the aims of the council. So it says, this sacred council has several aims in view. It desires to impart an ever-increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful. That was number one. Because you can hear echoed there the words of John XXIII. We want to kind of reinvigorate the, the life that the church has lived for 2,000 years. Two, to adapt more suitably to the needs of our own times those institutions which are subject to change. So there's an important distinction here between what is unchanging in the life of the church, which is the teachings on faith and morals and the sacraments and you know those things that are consistent all throughout the church's history, versus those disciplines in the life of the church that can change based on the times and the seasons in the church's life. And so the council wants to um, adapt those aspects of the church's life, which can change because of circumstances, to our own times. Third, to foster whatever can promote union among all who believe in Christ. So this is the really the ecumenical thrust, mm -hmm. right? The desire of John the Twenty Third, and this has certainly been echoed by the popes ever since. This desire to bring back into one the splintered body of Christ, the Christian people, which uh, after the divide between East and West, and the Protestant Reformation, and then since, you know, so many different um, split-offs from the Church and schisms, which has splintered us into so many different factions as Christians, there's this kind of new desire to do what we can to bring back that full union that Jesus prayed for at the end of his life, um, in his priestly prayer, the Father, that they may be one, as you and I are one. So this is very much on the mind of the bishops at Vatican II. And lastly, to strengthen whatever can help to call the whole of mankind into the household of the church. So this is the goal, right? to bring everyone, not only just non-Catholic Christians, but the whole of mankind into the church. Because we believe the church is the very gift of God for our salvation. And the church has this mission from Jesus, go out to all the world, baptizing, right? making disciples. So that's the goal. These are the four goals of council. And then they conclude, the council therefore sees particularly cogent reasons for undertaking the reform and the promotion of the liturgy. The liturgy, um, we, we are used to hearing the Eucharist called the source and summit of our faith, right? We're going to find that in here. Uh, the bishops recognize that it all begins and leads to the Eucharist and the liturgy. And so this is where they begin, with this desire um, to draw the whole world to the source and summit of our Christian faith, which is the sacred liturgy. So for next time, uh, if you want to read before you come, we're going to look at, it's actually a good portion of, of the document, but we're going to uh, pull just some of the highlights. The introduction and chapter one. Okay, so chapter one, after the uh, brief one-page introduction, is called General Principles for the Restoration and Promotion of the Sacred Liturgy. So the bishops are going to lay out these general principles that then will be applied to the Mass and the sacraments and the Liturgy of the Hours and sacred music and sacred art and all of these different aspects of the liturgy. So if you want to read in preparation, that would be what you want to read for next time. So um, chapter 1 goes all the way up to page 11. It would be the first 11 pages of the document.
And uh, when we gather next week at this time, then um, we're going to pull out some of the highlights of, of this section for us as we begin to kind of delve into the teaching of the Council on Liturgy. So that's all I have for today. Questions about kind of this introductory session? No questions. Perfectly clear. I have yes. question, but it's probably not clear. Maybe I misunderstood, but you said that um, when they voted, most of the bishops, you know, did agree, but not all of them. So don't they have to be valid to be a and You know what I mean? Like, how could they not vote if that's what was... The question is, why, essentially, tell me if I'm paraphrasing this right, why would any of the bishops not have voted in favor, essentially, because yes. aren't they called to be obedient? Yes. Um, what's happening is, is not so much the bishops voting on whether they accept the teaching of the church. It's voting on, is this the, the best way to, in this case, reform the liturgy? Or is this the best summary of these aspects of our faith? So it's more of a, um, not so much a, a question of the validity of the teaching itself as to, is this the best way to present it? Or are these the best practical steps for us to take at this moment in history. Other questions? Yeah. Father, I find it very interesting that at this time, the church was doing very well. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people in there. It was flourishing. That kind of uh, confuses me why it was flourishing. Wasn't it good at this time? The way they the mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, what, if the church, as they explained in the video, is, seemed to be flourishing, right, with uh, vocations and mass attendance and whatnot, um, which, by the way, I'll point out, they were speaking specifically about the church in our country at that moment. So they're talking about mass attendance and vocations in the United States, for example. Um, I'm not an expert in history, so I'm just speculating a little bit here. Um, there is sometimes this, this is kind of thrown out as an objection to the, uh, the wisdom of Vatican II, because it seems like the church was flourishing, Vatican II happened, and ever since then we've had plummeting mass attendance and a shortage of priests and, you know, all of these things happening. Um, it's important to point out, first of all, that there's, a, there's even a fallacy in logic you study logic that says just because something happened after something else doesn't necessarily mean it was caused by something else. Okay? So we don't want to attribute, we can't just directly attribute the struggles of the church to the council. And in fact, I would surmise that the struggles the church is dealing with had much more to do with what's happening in the world. You know, the, the secularism that's becoming more and more prominent in the world. And I mean, at the end of the 1960s and into the 70s, you've got the sexual revolution and you know, this resistance to all authority and all of these kind of movements happening more in the secular culture. Um, because I think what, uh, well, I'm certain what John the Twenty Third and, and the bishops of the church at that time wanted to do was to continue that, that the goodness that was happening in the church, right? And also to, um, to adapt as necessary to modern developments in the world so that that message, that saving message of, of the Christian faith, um, could be proposed to and received by by modern humanity. But I think there was probably a um, a, a sense already on, on the part of the uh, the Pope and the other bishops that challenging times were ahead, as they saw certain things happening in the world, and um, wanted to do everything they could to prepare the Church to to minister to that those changes that were coming. Thank you, Father. You know, it said the idea was to bring close people closer together. Mm -hmm. What I remember from this, and I do remember most of it, was that it caused a crisis in faith for a lot of people, mm -hmm. including me. Mm -hmm. Because it was like, okay, all this stuff that I had believed all my years growing up, now isn't true. Mm -hmm. So what do I believe? Yeah. And it was like I had to make my own decision about what I believed and what I didn't. You know, if a drop of water went down our throat before we went to communion, 
We were going to hell if we went to communion. Well, that wasn't right. We weren't going to hell if we ate meat on Friday either. But we thought we were. So, so many of these things that, you know, were just law. You didn't, you didn't dare say anything against them. Now we're there. And it just made a lot of people, a lot of people quit going to church because of it. Yeah, I'd share a couple of comments on that. One is that, um, like, disciplines of fasting before mm -hmm. communion or on Friday, mm -hmm. that's an example of disciplines in the church that can change, um, but that also were called to obedience to whatever the discipline is that the church has decided for this particular moment in history. We are called to obedience to that. But it can change and adapt over time. So that's an example of what was referred to as adapting those institutions in the church that are subject to change and reform. But I don't think we knew they could change. Mm -hmm. We thought they were, you know, like yeah, written, written in stone, mm -hmm. and they and they weren't yeah. going to change. Mm -hmm. And then they did. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say here is that um, there's a there's a it's an and that's why I think it's important for us to study the text of Vatican II because there's a difference between what the council says sometimes and what happened after the council. And the way that the council was implemented in different parts of the world is actually interesting to study um, because there was very quickly kind of this culture of dissent that led to this kind of, the Vatican II would just kind of be thrown out as a reason for any number of things that Vatican II might actually not have said. You know, and it was just kind of used as a reason for dissent from this or that teaching or, or whatnot in the, in the life of the church. Um, so the way the council was implemented, for example, in the United States versus in Poland. Um, in Poland, John Paul II, when he was Bishop of Krakow, he had this whole synod in his diocese to study the documents and to implement it. And... Um, He's often kind of held up in this example of how this was done well. And in fact, the church in Poland has been very um, flourishing and thriving, even throughout all of this tumult, yes. interestingly. Yes. Whereas a lot of times, I think in our country and in other parts of the world, um, unfortunately, there was this idea of rupture that they were talking about. And kind of Vatican II was just used as a, as a kind of a, an excuse for bringing about things that Vatican II didn't actually authorize and call for, and that negatively affected many Catholics because of how the, the rough waters that came after the Council because of how it was implemented. But Alice and then... Uh, I just had a totally different reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was, I think, graduated college in 64. I just felt it was so refreshing, the, uh, especially with the liturgy, um, having it in our own vernacular, the English, to me it was great. I love the participation that we finally, the congregation, we're really a part of it. Mm -hmm. And the other things that came about, the dissension in the country, I think the whole idea that with the technology, then we grew, the world grew closer, and I think that caused a lot of dissension. But as far as personally, the changes that it brought about and the way that we did the liturgy, I just I just grasped onto it with great enthusiasm. I just thought it was great. So I just had a totally different reaction. Mm -hmm. I too had a good reaction to it and I thought that more people were being included and uh, but and yet the the big elephant in the room was the women's liberation movement. And the women were saying, what about us? What about us? And uh, the church is going to have to address, you know, 50% of their, their population. Mm -hmm. But for, for us, for me, for a lay person, it was that we were being asked to participate more and understood what we were doing a little better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another, this one, this is for another document, actually, but the whole idea of the universal call to holiness is very much at the heart of much of what Vatican II said about the role of the laity, that we're all not just priests and nuns are called to holiness, to sanctity, but the whole church. Yes. You know, and the laity have a particular That's vocation right. and, and role exactly. to play in the life of the church. I don't think we have been called priest, prophet, kings before. No. Well, you have. 
<laughs> but you know, it, Vatican II brought that out again, right? And that, that was another, that would be an example of what they spoke about of the resource month, kind of that that's getting back to the sources. I mean, it's in scripture, and it's in the fathers of the church. Yes. And as the church, you know, grew and developed her theology, perhaps certain aspects of that were kind of obscured or forgotten. That's right. Um, or kind of brought back to the fore. Yes. But, um, yes. So. I remember thinking about high school or college about that time. Hey, Gerardo and now I'm in the Boot Hill. <laughs> and some of the families where I grew up, actually drove cars to St. Louis to the oratory because they did not like the way the mass was turned and changed. <laughs> and so there was this going on. And for me, it was mostly about the change in the mass itself. That I'm still, you know, I miss things. I miss the communion rail because I think kneeling brings back more reverence. But then I just have to get used to it. You know? <laughs> But my husband quit going because he didn't understand how you can say, you know, meet on Friday, what is this? This was always a discipline. Mm -hmm. So that was that issue. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really argue with him because I was new at it too. Mm -hmm. But I just said, this is what we need to do, to stay with it. Yeah. You know, never. So it's been a struggle. Well, and I will, I mean, as an example of what I was just saying, nowhere in this document doesn't say get rid of the communion rail. <laughs> it's not, As a matter of fact, the church in Chile still uses what happened later. Um, but, you know, now there was, this document then had to be put into practice, and there were commissions and whatnot that decided what reforms would happen, et cetera. Um, nowhere in Vatican II are you going to find it said, you can now meet on Friday, right? These are things that kind of happened afterwards. And in fact, if you read Canon Law, <laughs> This is a little bit of an aside, but it still tells you you can you can't eat meat on Friday. But our own the bishops of each country have the authority to adapt that to their country, and our bishops have said you can substitute some other penance for abstinence from meat on Friday. So, but um, anyway, that's an example of you know the, the documents, and also I would say another thing that is kind of a I think a sad outcome of the way that just history has unfolded is a lot of people think about Vatican II and all they think about is how the Mass changed, right, after Vatican II, which was significant, obviously. It's the source of some of our faith that's going to affect us. Um, but as we work our way through the other documents after this, there's a whole richness to Vatican II that's lost if all we think is Vatican II changed the Mass, because Vatican II was much bigger than that and much richer than that, as you'll see in the documents on the church and on divine revelation, all of these things that we have a chance to look at after the shoot. Any other questions, comments? I have a comment. Complaints, objections? I'm really glad that they masses in English because I don't know Latin. <laughs> I grew up with Latin masses. I never understood anything going on. So, I mean, even though they had missiles with the translation, it's not the same. And I think it's great that it's in English. Because I know there's a big push on to bring back the Latin masses. Well, you'll be interested when we get there to find that this document calls for Latin to be preserved. <laughs> it does, yes. But is that for the laity or just for for the mass? For the whole mass yeah. to be preserved, really? Anyway, we'll get there. I don't want to anticipate. <laughs> Spoiler alert! And I do love the Latin. So are they teaching Latin? I know my son had six years of Latin, but did they teach Latin normally in regular Catholic schools now? Uh, like the high school be, level, some of them. They do teach Latin. <laughs> Not all of them. As an elective. Yeah. All right, so we'll be back same time next week and we'll uh, venture into Sacra Sancta and the Children. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.